The third factor here is carbon dioxide itself, okay? So carbon dioxide exhibits what's called the carb amino effect, and that is the way carbon dioxide influences, again, this, sh this shift in the way that hemoglobin behaves because of the presence or absence of excess carbon dioxide or um, too little carbon dioxide. So CO2 reacts with hemoglobin to form what's called carb amino hemoglobin. And so if we have hemoglobin plus CO2 and they bind, we talked about the fact that hemoglobin um, does have the ability to move some carbon dioxide around. So there are three mechanisms for transporting carbon dioxide. We're gonna speak about the other two, but carbon dioxide can be mobilized on hemoglobin to a lesser extent. And so when we have this carb amino hemoglobin, this lowers the affinity for oxygen, okay? So basically the big picture here is that in excess uh, states, or if there's excess carbon dioxide, hemoglobin does not want to bind onto oxygen. It wants to let it go or to dissociate it, okay? So this again is, is, is aligning with that increase in metabolic activity. Remember, CO2 is a byproduct of respiring tissues. And so the more we have metabolic activity, the more CO2 will produce as a byproduct, and that'll shift our curve left or right. Right, 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 right. That'll shift our curve to the right, right? So again, aligning with that increase metabolic activity created by having more CO2. And if you think about the underlying physiology here, if tissues, again, are respiring more, are absorbing more CO2, are produce, absorbing more oxygen, producing more CO2, then we don't want oxygen to be very tightly bound to hemoglobin. We want it to be loosely bound so that it can dissociate off very easily to match the demand of those respiring tissues, okay? Okay. So here we're looking at the carb amino effect. Is that a question or oh, stretching? Okay, it's okay. Um, any questions at this point? I hope I'm not going too fast. Okay, so the carb amino effect is where we look at the fact that hemoglobin had this ability to bind CO2 and again, this is a reversible reaction, so we can bind it on. This gives us carb hemoglobin. Uh, yeah. Hemoglobin. All right, we call this carb amino hemoglobin. when it has that CO2 bound on. And again, we're looking here at the law of mass action just to make sense of this, which, say, which states that if we have increased CO2, which is our product, oops, CO2, which is our product here, that drives the reaction to the left. Okay, and again, if we are driving the reaction to the left, we're simply dissociating oxygen off from hemoglobin, okay? Which is right shifting. Okay, so this is also aligning with that increase in metabolic activity. And we'll just illustrate that here. Although this should be very, Okay, this should be very familiar at this point. This should make sense, right? So we've got our normal curve. We've got our right shift. And we've got our left shift. 
So shifting to the right is caused by an increase in CO2. And we know that increase in CO2 aligns with increased metabolic activity. Okay. And then decrease in CO2. causes a left shift, okay. So, so far we've talked about quite a few factors that influence the way hemoglobin behaves. We're gonna talk about one more factor, but so far we talked about temperature. So increase body temperature, we talked about partial pressure, right? Increased partial pressure. We talked about altitude, higher altitudes. We talked about carbon dioxide, increased carbon dioxide. We talked about pH, which is lower pH or increased acid. Those factors shift our curve to the right. And all of those factors align with increase in metabolic activity, okay? And then uh, factors that shift to the left were uh, decrease in temperature. And then we talked about lower altitudes, sea level and below sea level. 